morning. I am wishing you a happy Sunday, everybody. Let me see who's on. Good morning, Sister Nick. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Kid. Good morning, Angelica from Germany. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen, everybody. Can you hear me? Is everything okay? My, my iPad is away. Oh my goodness. We need our iPads. Can you hear me okay? I have adjusted my microphone so it's a little bit like out of my face, but I hope that it still registers. And um, yes, I noticed that one camera wasn't working, so it was very eerie. Like as I was playing and suddenly saw like darkness coming forth from the YouTube screen. So anyway, it was, um, it was pretty funny and a little bit unusual. So here in America, we are um, celebrating Memorial Day weekend. Um, and of course, oh, good morning, Thavi. Hey, great to see you. Oh, that piece we just heard is a piece by Tchaikovsky and it's called Baccarol. And we have heard that piece in a previous broadcast, but I thought it was a great um, theme piece to bring back because we're going to talk a bit today, dive into a very interesting story surrounding Tchaikovsky, and it also has to do with God's provision. So um, sit back. Uh, you know, get out your praise and worship because today we are going to lift up our hearts and prayers and um, come together because there's a lot to celebrate. And there's also a lot. Thank you, Angelica. Hi, Lizzie. Hey, welcome. There's also a lot we can also um, lean into God for today um, as a whole body of believers. So, um, Yes, so quick question. Is it cold where you are? Because Memorial Day weekend usually is a time where people open their pools here in New Jersey. Uh, we don't have a pool, but we like to be outside barbecuing and doing stuff, but it's 45 degrees, which is unbelievably cold for this time of year. So um, just wondering if the weather is good where you are. Um, and how you are celebrating the weekend. So, um, you know, it's funny. I don't know if, I think I mentioned in the last broadcast, I was doing some spring cleaning. And one of the things that I was cleaning out was my bookshelf. And my bookshelf was just, it was becoming like a clutter fest. It was just unbelievably cluttered. And, um, and I came upon like countless amounts of journals that I have written in and kept over the course of my life. So um, this is, and, you know, I will invest all sorts of money in journals. I don't know if you guys journal. It's cold, right, sister? Yeah, it's 51 degrees in Virginia, right? Lizzie says it's cold. Uh, yes, I know the piece has a bit of a haunting sound. It did that Baccarol. And we're going to talk a little bit about Tchaikovsky, um, Venice, which is uh, where he was inspired to write this piece, and um, also a very mysterious love story in his life. Um, so I found one of my old journals, and this one is, uh, you know, high performance planner, it's called, because I always try to be high performing. I don't succeed. Uh, <laughs> But I always think that if I buy another journal, it'll help get me there. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rod says it's 59 degrees. Yes. Oh, that's good. Where are you located, Ron? Just curious um, where you are. So anyway, the whole point of me sharing this is because I, I wrote in about three years ago in my journal, Lord, send me a Boaz. Okay. Does that make any sense to anybody. It took me a while to um, kind of retrace my my thoughts, retrace the, the thinking process I had when I wrote that. But um, I was referring to a scripture in the Bible. Um, in the Old Testament, 
from the book of Ruth. And it's an amazing story. We're going to talk about love stories today um, in the bigger picture of God's provision for our lives. We're going to frame it with the story, a love story between Ruth, her mother-in-law, Naomi, her faithfulness, and a man named Boaz, um, who came out of nowhere, it seemed, and the most unlikely story of love and provision in the time of to almost near total despair. So some of us might be going through something like this in our life right now. Um, we're at a time, a crossroads right now in our um, situation with COVID where this week, actually two days ago, they lifted the mask mandate here in New Jersey. Woo! That's exciting for vaccinated um, people. And so it's like a new feeling is in the air, kind of of like, are we getting back to somewhat normal? Are you guys sensing that? Oh, you're in Seattle, Ron. Oh my goodness. Okay, so that is, that's a nice nice place to be. I love Seattle and that whole Pacific Northwest. Um, but I just wonder if you are feeling that kind of sense too, where you are, like perhaps we are uh, getting to another like, pa like new territory, um, new hopefulness in this situation. Um, and of course it could be COVID, it could be whatever. Um, it is, you know, any situation that we're passing in our life. Um, let me just quickly just put this back on. Never lock my iPad. That's important. Why do you lock all the time, iPad? I don't need you to lock. I don't want you to lock. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, so let me just get my notes together because um, we're going to jump in right now because there's so much to cover today. Um, and of course, I arrange everything in such a way on my iPad that whenever I need to access it, it's never around. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, let's start with um, lifting our hearts in prayer. We're going to thank God. Thank you, Lord. Uh, for this time together, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to bless and anoint our time, anoint the sound of our voices, our collective hearts um, that just lift up to you. Lord, we're thanking you for new freshness in life, Lord. We are thanking you because you take us from season to season, Lord, and you part the Red Sea and you allow for new things to happen, Lord. In our weakness, we are indeed made strong. We thank you for the power of new beginnings. We thank you for your provision. And Lord, today we stand in expectancy, knowing that, Lord, you are sending your people, your harvesters, um, your um, sent angels to help us to the next level in our lives, whether it's um, new employment opportunities, Lord, send the right people, Lord, whether it's um, new opportunities in our health, um, special doctors, Lord, send your people. If it's for new teachers that we need, um, new relationships that need to enter to inspire us to take us to the next level, Lord, we thank you for that. Um, Lord, we lift up to you today um, our prayers of thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, let's, yes, today, okay, so just the, um, let me just give you an overview. Um, so today we're going to read a bit the story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz and frame the story of God's provision. We are then going to talk about a very unlikely, incredible story between uh the composer Tchaikovsky and an, a woman who entered his life um, in a very mysterious way was in a way his Boaz, and we'll learn about that, and the fruit of that relationship, and we'll hear it through the lens of music as well, and how to listen to the deeper message of great music. How does that sound? Okay, let's do it. 
Um, we are reading from Ruth chapter 2. So just to frame the story, there's a woman named Naomi, and um, she leaves Israel with her husband, and they have sons. However, she becomes a widow, and then um, her sons also get married, but they die. And so she is all alone in the world and she's in a foreign land, but she hears that back in Israel, um, the crops are growing again and there's like a resurgence of life. It's kind of a situation like we're feeling right now, like the pandemic is maybe getting to another place where, you know, lifting the mask mandate and stuff. So it's like hopefulness. So she decides to return back to Israel um, with her daughters-in-law. But as she's as they're traveling back, she has um, a change of heart and she really doesn't want her daughter-in-laws to um, throw away their lives and stick with her. So um, she tells them, go back, return to your own people. I don't have younger sons who could grow up and be your husbands. Um, so I agree for you that the Lord um, has, pun has punished me in a way that injures you. So all these bad things have happened. My husband has died. My sons have died. Your husbands now have died. Uh, I don't want to further your, your troubles. And um, so one of the daughters-in-law says, okay, I'm going to go back to my homeland. But the other daughter-in-law named Ruth, says to Naomi, don't make me leave you, for I want to go wherever you go and live wherever you live. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. I want to die where you die and be buried there. May the Lord do terrible things to me if I allow anything but death to separate us. Now, what a loyalty what a loyalty Ruth has for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Um, so they both came to Bethlehem. And of course, this is all precursor to Jesus. The Old Testament points to Jesus. So um, they arrive at Bethlehem and, um, you know, so Naomi still has relatives there. So she actually had a wealthy relative named Boaz. And so one day, Ruth said to Naomi, uh, perhaps I can go into the fields of some kind man to glean the free grain behind his reapers. So, um, so basically, they were, they were um, cutting the wheat. And so the fall off was something um, that she wanted to collect for food. So basically, the scraps from the wheat. Um, so Naomi said, okay, Ruth, go ahead and do that. Um, and, but it happened, okay, that the field where she found herself belonged to Boaz, this wealthy relative of Naomi's. Um, so, you know, again, I just, I just pray right now that the Lord plants us in the right field, that um, the Holy Spirit this week for each and every one of us points the direction where we should go because there could be a field like that is exactly the right field where we're going to meet that person or have that experience to take you to the next level. So just praying to be placed in the right field for this season. So um, Boaz shows up at the field and says to his foreman, hey, who's that girl there? And so the foreman replied, it's that girl from the land of Moab who came with Naomi. Um, she asked me if she could pick up the grain, um, fall off. And so she's been there doing this um, and she's been at it constantly. So another aspect that Ruth says is not only her loyalty, but her discipline. She sticks to it. She doesn't give up. What a great, what a great characteristics she has. Um, she has been at it except for a few minutes to rest in the shade. So hard work, but she doesn't shy away. So Boaz was curious. He went over to talk to her and said, um, listen, stay right here with us 
um, to glean. Don't go to any other fields. Again, stay in this one. Stay right behind my women workers. I have warned the young men not to bother you. When you are thirsty, go and help yourself to water. And she thanked him so warmly. She said to Boaz, how can you be so kind to me? You must know that I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. And I also know about all the love and kindness you have shown to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and mother in your own land and have come here to live among strangers. May the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, bless you for it. So again, those things that Ruth was doing, supposedly in secret, like the devotion to her mother-in-law, like her stick intuitiveness in the field, the fact that she didn't spare herself, um, but just worked at the task at hand. All these hidden things are something that Boaz was taking account of. So it just speaks to the fact that all those things we do in private, that we think nobody is looking, um, you know, they all have weight. You know, I'll never forget one time I was in Dunkin' Donuts and I was waiting online and some, and it was my turn. And so, you know, I got my coffee and, and everything. And then the cashier, I said, you know, how much? And she goes, oh, it's free. And I said, what? What do you mean it's free? And she said, oh, the person ahead of you online prepaid for you. I said, a total stranger would pay for my coffee? And she said, yeah. Yeah, she does that all the time. So I, I ran out just when she was getting into the car to thank her. I mean, she didn't even want to be thanked. She just did it. She, I said, what made you do it? She goes, I just wanted to bless you. And I was, um, again, like, you never forget things like that. Those random acts of kindness. So those things we do in secret. So um, anyway, so Naomi and Ruth live and they have food and one day Naomi in true you know matchmaker style says my dear she says to Ruth isn't it time for you to find a husband and get happily married again and so Ruth is thinking well maybe and so Naomi says I'm thinking of someone for you and it's Boaz Oh, yeah. Okay. Always wanted to have a provider like Boaz. He has been so kind to us and is a close relative. And I love this part because it sounds so much like my mother. <laughs> now do what I tell you. Bathe and put on some perfume and some nice clothes and go on down to the threshing floor. Don't waste time. I'll never forget when um, I brought my husband, who was just, you know, a guy I met at that time. Uh, we were having our second date. And so I brought him to meet my parents. And so I I came downstairs uh, before he showed up. And I was, I was like appropriately dressed, like black slacks and a white, you know, button up to the top collar, white cotton shirt my father said where are you going uh, dressed like that I said I'm going on a date you know that and she said uh you're not wearing that on a date let me show you what to wear and she like put together this outfit for me she's like this is how you need to dress for a date put on some perfume put your hair down and that's how you have to go on a date and um anyway you gotta listen to mom because <laughs> we were married two weeks later <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so she goes and she does what Ruth says and she, you know, has, has um, a moment with Boaz um, and she shows up in his room and he was startled. Uh, who are you? And because it was dark and she says, it's I, Ruth, 
Make me your wife according to God's law, for you are my close relative. I like it. She gets to the chase. She cut, she, this is a gal that knows what she wants, okay? Make me your wife. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and he says, thank God for a girl like you, for you are being even kinder to Naomi now than before. And here's what he says. Naturally, you'd prefer a younger man, even though poor, but... You have put aside your personal desires. Now, don't worry about a thing, my child. I'll handle all the details for everyone knows what a wonderful person you are. And so he did. He handled all the details. And um, he, had, he had made the choice to marry Ruth. And so Boaz married Ruth. And when he, uh, they were uh, married, they had a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse and grandfather of King David. So, so powerful a message here on so many levels that, um, you know, because we know that it is through this union of Boaz and Ruth that we get, like, two... Um, generations later, we get King David from this union. And then we know that Jesus comes from the lineage of King David. And what's interesting is the Jew and Gentile in that union of Boaz and um, of Ruth being uh, from another land, they already come together. So again, it's the precursor to um, Jesus coming to bring everybody into the fold. So, um, yes, Boaz comes at a very, very important time. So let's now segue into this story of Tchaikovsky and a person who was like a Boaz in his life. And um, a very interesting story. So, um, so Tchaikovsky was born in 1840 and died in 1893 um, in Russia. Have eh, Boaz the blessing. Amen. Yes, what an incredible story, right? There's hope all the time. And, um, you know, just praying for the right people to come into our lives at the right time, at the predestined time, and for us to be placed in the right place for these abundant blessings. So Tchaikovsky was uh, work, he was already um, quite well known as a composer. How many of you have um, ever seen or heard the Nutcracker Ballet? It's probably one of Tchaikovsky's most famous works. Has anybody ever, um, Padmini and I were taking a ballet class together when my daughters used to do ballet and, uh, they would often have a uh, live piano playing and the music of Tchaikovsky was part of the class. It was so wonderful. Remember that Padmini? Ah, oh, yes, there is hope. There is hope. And our Boaz could come any minute. Get the perfume on. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, sister. Oh, yes. So, um, so yes, Tchaikovsky. Um, we, his music is so beautiful. His music is like, it just rips your heart out. It's so beautiful. I um, <laughs> love that. Um, I remember when I, actually, Tchaikovsky means, it has a very special place in my life because it's through Tchaikovsky that I, um, as a child, developed a intense love of classical music. And I had a LP. Yes, I'm a, a product of the 70s. Um, yes, yes. The New York, the Nutcracker Ballet performed by the New York City Ballet. That is, that is a treat. Oh my gosh, yes. Right? Those were fun times, Panmini. Us, us doing... Uh, us doing those bar exercises, right? Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I had an LP of The Nutcracker when I was a little girl, and I remember just listening to this music. I would dance to it, like I would put on my mother's like flowy nightgowns and pretend I was a ballerina and dance to it, but I, I would have a hard time dancing to it because I would just stop and be mesmerized by how beautiful this music was, and... I, sometimes I just start crying spontaneously and that's what the music of Tchaikovsky does it just it has such like your heart is so full listening to this music it has all the passion all the emotion mystery depth sadness um, and so we're going to explore those were some fun times we're going to explore a little bit more so Let's now go to Tchaikovsky. He's um, he's now established as a composer in Russia. But as it goes, musicians, it's hard. You need to have some sort of day job, right? You need to do something to pay the bills. And so for him, it was teaching at the conservatory. Um, I actually have one of the harmony books that Tchaikovsky wrote. And he wrote that when he was a professor in the conservatory in um, Moscow. And it, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. But, you know, composing is his number one love and it was his purpose. But he had to teach to supplement his income. Well, in comes a mysterious Boaz. Let me introduce her to you. Her name um, is... Nadazha, I don't know, let's call her Nadine, <laughs> Von Meck, okay, so Madame Von Meck, let's, let's talk about this mysterious person for a second, so she comes from a family that's quite well to do, but she married an engineer, a civil worker, um, and with him they had 13, yes, 13 children. Okay. Um, she was not living a lavish lifestyle with him at all. In fact, he, they, um, he was only making like a few hundred kopecks, which doesn't amount to very much, um, and had to support the whole family on that. But um, she saw the possibility in her husband. And that's the one thing about this uh, woman is like, she is, has a tendency, she was not a perfect woman, but she had vision. And she saw her husband as capable of doing much more than just working for the government as an underpaid engineer. And so she keeps pressing him like, hey, you know, you should use your engineering skills to go into the railroad industry because that is where things are at. So um, it's like mid-century Russia at this point, they only had 100 miles of railroad down in 1860. 100 miles in 1860. Can you imagine the hugeness of Russia and only 100 miles of railroad track? So, so Nadine Von Meck tells her husband, hey, leave your job. We'll eat beans for a while until you get on your feet. And so they did. His uh, income went down to 20 kopecks only while he was like trying to establish himself as an entrepreneur. But when he did, oh my goodness, um, it's largely due to him and his efforts that um, 20 years later, there were over 100, no, there were only 15,000 miles. There were over 15,000 miles of new railroad um, tracks and system in Russia. And he became a multimillionaire. Okay. So now um, they're living the good life, um, but she is a really, really, uh, let's say, um, tough, visionary, but very disciplined woman. Um, and so eventually um, her husband dies. And she then goes into seclusion. She decides she doesn't want to like deal with society anymore. So, okay. 
So she lives on her own with her kids and she doesn't even meet the the spouses or like if her kids wanted to marry into another family, she didn't even bother meeting that family. Like that's how much of a recluse she became. So, but she didn't stop ruling the kids' life. Um, she ruled them with an iron fist. She arranged their marriages. She bought houses for them. She even chose furniture for their houses. Um, if she wanted to see, yeah, Nadezda von Meck. Um, if she wanted to see her kids, uh, she didn't invite them. She summoned them, like, come see me. So, again, not, not a perfect person. Tough tough, tough, tough. Um, and she was always compulsively busy. Um, she would always, uh, like inspect the houses that her servants were working in from like, from the basement to the roof, going through every inch. So she was a really like very, very tough taskmaster. Um, so, you know, she knew she was hard to tolerate. And in one letter, uh, she actually did say, I am a very unsympathetic uh, person in my personal relationships because I do not possess any femininity whatsoever. Second, I do not know how to be tender. And this characteristic has passed on to my entire family. All of us are afraid to be affected or sentimental. Um, interesting that she then creates this relationship with Tchaikovsky, whose music is always uh emotional and always very well i wouldn't say sentimental exactly but it does possess it doesn't shy away at all from laying all emotions bare she did support musicians and uh she actually did call the young Debussy, Claude Debussy, famous French composer. Before he became the famous French composer, he was an 18-year-old uh, student that already was catching the attention all over France for his genius. And so she summoned him to be actually a music tutor for her kids. So helped him out helped out um, another violinist, um, well-known composer, Vianaski, helped him as well. And then one day uh, she, uh, of course, hears Tchaikovsky's music and writes the letter that will change both of their lives forever. She wrote to Tchaikovsky, calling herself a fervent admirer. Um, and she commissioned some pieces for him to write for violin and piano, and she did play the piano. Um, so, so now Tchaikovsky is thinking about marriage. So he married his one uh, student, and it was an absolute abysmal disaster. He went, he had a breakdown over it. He was so unhappy. It was a total mess. And, um, but already he's established this relationship with a countess, the Von Meck. And she had only one rule about their relationship, which was they were never to meet and they never did meet. But what they started to do was write letters, a correspondence in letters that became a love story in and of itself because they shared all the intimate details of their life together, of their life apart, of ideas, of, you know, Tchaikovsky would write to her, um, fleshing out ideas for different pieces. And she understood him from a spiritual and artistic level um, that nobody else quite did. And so they had this incredible bond. Uh, it was like a, a spiritual love affair. Like, and it wasn't an affair, it was just like a bond that transcended all reality. And it even transcended the physical because they never did meet. Um, he actually was receiving from her. She became his number one patron, which allowed him to quit his day job 
that was a Boaz situation because she gave him an allowance of 6,000 rubles per year, which was a large amount. Um, and it was simply so that he could completely focus on his creative work. Now, just to give you a perspective, he was getting 6,000 rubles and um, a minor government official in those days had to support his whole family on 300 to 400 rubles. So it was a large amount and Tchaikovsky, you know, dissolved his marriage. So he had no children. And so he lived alone and um, nevertheless, um, it created this situation. So between 1877 and 1890, uh, Von Meck and Tchaikovsky lived their life through letters. Um, over 1,200 letters they wrote. Um, you know, Tchaikovsky didn't feel 100% comfortable with that financial agreement. He felt sort of awkward about it. He wrote in a letter to her, in my relations with you, there is ticklish circumstance that every time we write one another, money appears on the scene. So it wasn't ideal. There was always that ugh, money problem. But they, again, had an intimacy um, in their whole um, letters to one another that allowed for them to really bridge the gap between reality and that artistic um, other world that transcended reality. Um, so let's now um, listen to a piece uh, that Tchaikovsky wrote. We're going to listen to fragments of it. And I'm also going to um, give you a background uh, through a letter that Tchaikovsky was writing at the time of composition to Von Meck. And this is a very unique window to understanding music that is uh, that has no words, that is, as classical music is in symphonies um abstract what does it mean uh tchaikovsky was composing his fourth symphony passionate large-scale work and it took him quite a bit of time to finish this and he had a lot of personal disruptions so when he was going through his divorce he left russia and found a lot of renewal in italy he spent time in venice he spent time in Florence. He loved those two cities. They filled him with life. And um, so it was in these places that he filled in a large sections of the fourth symphony. Yes, uh, Padmini, I love the other world that transcends reality on the parallel realm of the, you know, it's so incredible, isn't it? Um, yes, that. And the music transcends the reality. So let's go now a little bit deeper into the fourth symphony and hear what goes through a composer's creative process when they write this music, which will give us a window to how to understand this music when we hear it. So let um, us turn to this. So, okay. So Von Meck wanted to know, hey, you know, tell me, Tchaikovsky, what inspires you? Like, you know, wouldn't you want to sit down with a writer that you love or a painter or any kind of creative person that you admire? Wouldn't you like to just pick their brain? Like, hey, I love this piece of music you wrote. I love this painting you did. I, you know, look at it all the time and imagine what you thought when you painted. Like, what did you think? What was on your mind? What inspired you? What does it mean? Because a lot of times with classical music, we could feel distant from it. We don't know what it means. Uh, like I was having a conversation with my daughter yesterday. Um, we were talking about uh, this topic and she said, you know, I like it when I know the background because it helps me connect with the music. And so here's the, here's what Tchaikovsky says, you know, um, to Von Meck. You ask if there's a definite story behind the symphony. Um, the answer 
when people ask me, what's the story behind this work? The answer is there is no story. So that's interesting. But here's what he does reveal. Um, that it's, you, you know, like you can't put into words those sensations that um, you experience when you're in the process of writing. So he gives a clue. He says, you know, it's kind of something happening outside of my control. I would say it's something happening in the spirit, right? Um, to decipher exactly like what is going on. So that's one clue is that, you know, and I always think that these great artists are more messengers. They're just, you know, they have to empty themselves to allow the spirit to work through them. Um, so here he does say that there is that aspect of, I don't really know what's happening. I just enter into that realm where I allow the creative process to happen through me. So that's number one. Um, then he says number two, um, it's, a, it's a lyrical process that is fundamentally the unburdening of the soul in music. How many times have you ever felt in your life so much turmoil, so much grief, so much confusion in your heart that all you, and like it actually was causing you physical pain like, uh, you know, in your throat, like you, you have so much emotion, your throat sort of gets all constricted or your heart feels constricted and you just want to unburden yourself. Well, this great music can act as a tool for that. Okay. Because he's saying I'm unburdening. I'm having all these problems in my, you know, relationship. I just had a nervous breakdown. Um, you know, he's being like criticized by, you know, people in music business, you know, it's like, he's got a lot of things. He needed to get it off his chest. Music was the way for him to do it. It's not only his personal soul, it's our collective soul. Cause all of us experience feelings like that, a broken relationship, um, difficulties in our, um, careers, right? Being criticized, being misunderstood. Yeah, these are universal problems. Okay, so um, he says this is very much like a poet, all right, uh, expresses himself in verse. The only difference is that music has much more powerful means and a more subtle language in which to express thousands of different emotions and frames of mind. So he's basically saying, you know, this is an endless landscape where we can all collectively unburden our souls and fill in the blanks. And um, I, I have had situations in my life where there was so much turmoil in my heart and so much confusion and so much grief in different times that the music of Tchaikovsky helped purge it. And if it wasn't for this music, I don't know if I would be able to just per, like let it out. It just is so me Just listening to, for instance, the Sixth Symphony was was such a piece for me. Um, and I hope that uh, this music might inspire you to, you know, if there's something on your heart, to just let the music take it away because it, it it is. It is coming from a higher place. So, so Von Meck is in his life. He's writing the fourth symphony. And now he's telling her some clues, what to listen for. So now we get into it. Um, there's no story, but I'm going to tell you, Tchaikovsky says to her, some clues that um, are in the symphony. So he says, the introduction is big, you know, and you're going to hear this in a second. Um, he says that the introduction is the seed of the whole symphony. It's the main idea. And this represents the idea of fate, that fateful force, which prevents the impulse to happiness from attaining its goals, which jealousy ensures that peace and happiness shall not be complete and unclouded, which hangs above the head like the sword of Damocles, unwaveringly constantly poisoning the soul. 
It is an invisible force that can never be overcome, merely endured hopelessly. So let's listen to this idea of fate and how Tchaikovsky represents it in the opening of the fourth symphony, first movement. Okay, so we can hear that element of fate, this resistance force. Um, again, relating it to the story of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi, like with Ruth and Naomi, it was like that sword, that fate, where um, Naomi said, you know what, the Lord has taken away everything from me, my sons. Um, he's, you know, left me alone, you know, so in a way, this symphony, we can relate to any situation in our life where we feel desperate. That's the fate. So this music is episodic. It enters just like life. It flows into different states of emotion. So, um, the bleak and hopeless feelings, uh, Tchaikovsky writes, grow stronger and stronger. Uh, and then he says, we get a next episode. It's kind of like escapism. It's like, isn't it better to escape from reality and immerse oneself in dreams? So the need to, it's too much to handle. Let's just go off to another world. Let's listen to this section, which is escape. So this is uh, a performance conducted by Herbert von Karajan, one of my very, very favorite conductors. Um, and one thing to, to listen for is the timpanis, the you know, percussion instrument. It, in moments, it sounds like that sword where you will hear in those uh, desperate moments you know, it, like it just is like cutting through like a sword. But then in moments of, you know, these daydreams, uh, this escape, it sounds more like the heart beating. 
Oh, yes. I mean, it, Carion, when he conducted, it was, he became the music. He truly became the music. Uh, you could see that, Kit, you're so, uh, you know, on it because he literally, he would internalize the whole score. So he didn't even need to look at the music. So there was no barrier between him and the sound. And he molded his orchestras, like the Berlin Philharmonic, for instance. Like he molded them. So it was like one organic whole in their rehearsals. And um, he just... I mean, I, he's a, like such a genius, and you feel the intensity towards the end of his life. Ah, oh, Angelica, I love you so much. Um, towards the end of his life, he was making these films with the music, so he was really setting the stage for this fusion of. And I love the way this is filmed. Right? Isn't this absolutely beautiful? So. Um, how do you spell it? Carion. Um, K A R A J A N. And afterwards, I'll put another link. Probably YouTube will silence me because I'm putting these excerpts here, but at least we can enjoy them now, right? <laughs> um, now we go into another phase of even more of this like reality versus fantasy in this symphony. So again, it's amazing to see the transformation from the opening of fate and despair into sunlight. And now finally we get to a point where um, it's almost like the despair is forgotten. And for the first time, we have happiness, happiness again. Um, again, like the story of Ruth, happiness again. A chance, like with Boaz and the restoration. Um, there's always, with God, um, you know, sometimes we have to remember, I love this line that I heard from someone, we can't put a period where God put a comma, right? So sometimes we think it's over, but the best is yet to come.
Okay, so now after this, this, you know, moment, this glimpse of beauty and happiness and sunshine, we're, we're plunging back into the depths. Um, and this is how he closes the first movement. He says, no, those were daydreams. Fate wakes us up from there. Now notice how the initial theme of fate comes back in and listen to those timpanis and like those swords coming down. guys think isn't that some amazing music yes god is writing our story absolutely what is interesting about tchaikovsky's words about the symphony first movement um, to von meck uh, was and he dedicated this piece to her it was like a foreshadowing of how their relationship then would be challenged uh, towards the end of that um, writing relationship again which spanned so many years and which was so highly highly emotive and so personal and they basically shared everything they knew everything about one another in fact these letters were forbidden um, to even like be publicly displayed because they were so personal in nature but um they're hard to find um the book of these letters it then later become became published um and was just a treasury to understand um the life of tchaikovsky even more because he didn't leave behind much more than these letters but listen to what happened remember how um he said in the beginning of the symphony to von Meck, it's like fate, uh, that like fate because of jealousy is going to have uh, the final say in the thing. Well, it, he was in a way foreshadowing what would happen at the end of their relationship because jealousy did try to destroy the relationship. I say try because it didn't. But um, what happened was, it was a nice idea. Uh, you know, Von Meck and Tchaikovsky had this incredible spiritual union and they thought, well, let's actually consummate this union by having, uh, you know, Von Meck said, my son marry your niece, Tchaikovsky. And that way we'll be like forever united as family. Um, so in theory, uh yeah like thunder exactly so in theory it, 
sounded like a great idea, but in reality, it was an absolute disaster because um, Tchaikovsky's niece ended up really dominating Von Meck's son, which caused uh, a whole bunch of turbulence and turmoil in the family. And also, um, I think there was also pressure from the family that she should sever ties with the composer. Um, there were some financial messes that went on in the business. Uh, some family members didn't keep track of the monies very well. And as a result, um, she was basically forced to discontinue supporting Tchaikovsky and to discontinue all ties with Tchaikovsky. Um, she sent him a letter saying, you know, here's your last year support from me. And that was it. And um, what happened afterwards was just, it, they were so highly in tune with one another. He died not long after that. And she died two months after Tchaikovsky. Um, so it was true love. And in those two months after Tchaikovsky's death, before Von Meck died, somebody asked her, said, how did how have you endured the death of Tchaikovsky, your beloved? She said, I did not endure it. And so she died. Um, but thanks to this relationship that was, again, they never met, but they had such depth of inspiration from one another. And thanks to her, we have so much great music. Um, and you know, just praying, um, for you all to this week. Um, you know, if this music, I'm, I'm hoping because you know, this music, if we don't educate and talk about and play this music, then it's going to be gone. Now, what I mean by that is that, um, symphonies are closing down, especially with the pandemic uh, performance series. They haven't been going at full tilt. And even I read an article about Juilliard um, that they're trying to get their students now like ready for the real world, which means classical music is not very lucrative and there are not many opportunities and certainly not the opportunities that there were even 20 years ago because so many orchestras have shut down. So what they're trying to introduce now is uh, getting like pop stars like Taylor Swift to come and give them courses how to parlay um, from classical to pop. So, you know, these signs are disturbing. Howard University just got rid of their whole classics department. Like Plato, Aristotle, these guys don't count anymore. So um, this is my modest attempt to try to uh, do, my, do my part to keep the interest in classical alive because it's not um, simply a genre. It's an essential part of our humanity. It's an essential part of our collective soul that resonates on such a high level. And when we dive into these waters together, we're all coming up to a higher place. It's transformative music. It is a high energy music. So um, classical music cannot die. That would be a travesty. Yes, except if it's not funded. Um, if we don't have orchestras being funded anymore, uh, it goes. And unfortunately, the young people in school, I know from my kids, they're now um, college age, but even when they were in grade school, it was like they did the um, music ABCs. So like every week they would, you know, A, they would, you know, study whatever A was. When they got to B, okay, so in classical music, there are many composers um, whose names start with B, like Beethoven, for instance, Brahms, for instance, right? There are just so many Bs in classical music. Bach, you can choose from a lot. They, in like 10 years ago, they went with Beyonce. What? This is 
supposed to be music education. Um, so I have, I have my, my um, particular um, ideas about this and I'm passionate about keeping this alive. So what can you do? Listen, listen to some Tchaikovsky this week. His symphonies are so great. His symphonies will take you to places. The Sixth Symphony is also a very one of my favorites. Uh, my two favorites are the Fourth and the Sixth. Um, just uh, to let you know, the Fourth Symphony has four movements to it. Um, and actually, after this turbulent first movement, the next two are a little different. The second one kind of steeps us in that feeling of sadness for a little longer. But the third takes us away to like, again, let's forget about our troubles. And in the fourth, his mission statement with that one was, you know, we can always find joy. We have to look outside of ourselves. So that, just think about how you could be driving in the car, listening to this and get all this spiritual food for yourself in such a pleasurable way and you'll feel better your heart will be better because it's proven that classical music is really good for the heart it's good for the mood it's good for endorphins it's just good for us so and plants grow better look at my plants i hardly water them right so there you go okay i love you guys next week we are deep diving on schubert oh my goodness, if you enjoyed Tchaikovsky, Schubert will blow you into another dimension. Schubert, we're pairing with um, the topic of purpose. Oh boy, if you, I did this teaching last week and people were like, oh my goodness, I was stuck and now I'm unstuck thanks to this whole teaching on purpose and the music of Schubert will inspire you to get unstuck. So come for that, invite your friends, um, support the channel by liking and you know, more subscribers we could get the better and stay tuned for next week. Uh, I'll be posting on social, on Instagram, especially and Facebook, um, you know, the behind the scenes on the Schubert this week. So I'd love for you to catch that. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Um, the links are below and I love you guys. We have classical here in Seattle. They are listener supported station and available online. That's good. So, you know, we have to find those online radio stations that play great music. Um, terrific kit. I'm so happy to hear. Yeah. Um, has what they call a box school for the, the school. Anyone can donate there. I love that. Yes. Oh, I am going to look into that. Thank you for that um, mention, Kit. You guys are the best. This community is so awesome. I, I just, I just, I'm so grateful for you guys. And um, just praying God's blessing over you all. Lord, thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you because um, your word is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your love is enduring, and we thank you for this new season. We thank you for this new song. We are singing a new song unto thee, Lord, and let us hear it from you so that we can repeat it back to you um, so that we are on the same song and singing harmonies that respond to yours. In every area of our life, in area of um, our personal growth, in area of our spiritual growth, in area of our financial growth, in areas of relationship growth, and Lord, all those places, Lord, where your light enters and breaks through the darkness. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you for being here. Love you guys. Come back for Schubert next week. And um, yeah, can't wait to see you. All right. Have a great week. Bye, everyone.